Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the great 20th century French phenomenologist, once wrote, all the great philosophical ideas of the past century, the philosophies of Marx and Nietzsche, phenomenology, German existentialism, and psychoanalysis, had their beginnings in Hegel. According to Martin Heidegger, Hegel represented the consummation of the 2,500 years of Western philosophy since Plato, for better or worse. Though many thinkers across the 19th and 20th centuries tried to distance themselves from Hegel's philosophy, Michel Foucault warned us about the difficulty of this task. Quote, Truly to escape Hegel involves an exact appreciation of the price we have to pay to detach ourselves from him. We have to determine the extent to which our anti-Hegelianism is possibly one of his tricks directed against us, at the end of which he stands motionless, waiting for us. Who really was Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel? this profound philosopher who arguably consummated Western philosophy's 2,500-year history, who spawned philosophical movements as diverse as Marxism, phenomenology, existentialism, and psychoanalysis, who so many are still trying to detach themselves from today, only to find him waiting patiently at the end of the road. Today, we're going to take a look at just one dimension of Hegel's philosophy, Hegel and mysticism. What exactly is Hegel's connection to mysticism? Wasn't Hegel the great philosopher of reason and the great enemy of all mystification? Wasn't it Hegel who said, quote, what is rational is actual and what is actual is rational? What could that have to do with mysticism of all things? In this presentation, I hope to convince you that Hegel, the arch-rationalist, was also a great proponent of mysticism. As Hegel writes, quote, everything rational is to be called at the same time mystical, end quote. My name is Dylan Schall. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Toronto with a thesis on Hegel titled Hegel's Concept of Reconciliation on Absolute Spirit. But enough about me, let's learn about Hegel. DWF Hegel is widely considered to be one of the most important philosophers in the Western tradition. Born in Stuttgart in 1770, the same year as Beethoven and Wordsworth, he studied at the Tübingen Seminary as a young man, with fellow future philosophers Schelling and Holderlin as his roommates. Hegel lived at a time of great historical change. The French Revolution took place when he was just 19 years old. He would later call it, quote, a glorious mental dawn when all thinking beings shared in the jubilation of the epoch. During an academic stint, as an unsalaried lecturer at the University of Jena, Hegel witnessed Napoleon riding through town on his march of conquest through Europe. In a letter, Hegel called Napoleon the world's soul on horseback. From Jena, Hegel would go on to work as a newspaper editor in Bamberg and a high school principal in Nuremberg before finally securing a permanent academic position as a professor at the University of Heidelberg, and then as the chair of philosophy at the University of Berlin, where he became the most renowned thinker of his day. Hegel died in 1831 at the age of 61, likely due to an epidemic of cholera. So, what is Hegel's philosophy all about? If there's one thing you've heard about Hegel, it's probably his famous three-part dialectic, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, 
The only problem is, Hegel never said that. But it is indeed true that Hegel's system does have a triadic structure, sequences of three terms, each of which can be broken down into three further terms, and so on, in a nested fractal triangle of triangles. Hegel's mature philosophical system can be found in his Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences in basic outline. At the most general level, the encyclopedia is divided into three main parts, logic, nature, and spirit. As Hegel tells us, logic, nature, and spirit are the three modes of the absolute idea, essentially Hegel's technical term for God as the totality of reality, more on which in a moment. Thus, Hegel writes, quote, philosophy has no other object but God, and so is essentially rational theology, and as the servant of truth, a continual divine service, end quote. Hegel tells us that logic, the first part of his system, refers to, quote, God as God is in God's eternal essence before the creation of the world, end quote. Nature is the first dimension of creation, namely the spatiotemporal world of physical, chemical, and biological entities as studied by the natural sciences. Finally, spirit simply refers to human beings and everything that human beings uniquely do. Spirit is divided into three terms, each of which are further divided into three. First, subjective spirit, anthropology, phenomenology, and psychology. Second, objective spirit, abstract right, morality, and ethical life, including the family, civil society, and the state. And finally, absolute spirit, art, religion, and philosophy. I wasn't kidding, this guy really likes his threes. The end of Hegel's system in philosophy rejoins the beginning of the system in logic, thereby completing a grand systematic circle. Absolute spirit, that is, art, religion, and philosophy, are three ways that human beings can apprehend the absolute idea, the whole of reality, logic, nature, and spirit. Hegel says that art, religion, and philosophy all contain the same truth content, the absolute, but merely express this content in different forms. Art expresses the absolute in the form of sensibility or feeling, the sound of music, the sight of a painting, and so on. Religion expresses the absolute in the form of representation. Narratives about God and humanity, for example, the Bible, communal rituals, and so on. Philosophy expresses the absolute in the form of the concept, that is, rigorous, rational arguments. In a certain sense, philosophy is thus the conceptual comprehension of the same truths felt through art and represented through religion. To take an example, Hegel says that his own encyclopedia system of logic, nature, and spirit is the philosophical conceptual expression of the Christian religious representation of the Trinity. Logic is the father, nature is the son, and spirit is, you guessed it, the Holy Spirit. All three are modes of the absolute idea, or God, and relate to each other in a circular perichoresis or circumcession, to use the technical Christian theological vocabulary, literally the circulation of the three divine persons, sometimes pictured as an eternal circle dance. For Hegel, the whole of reality is this eternally dancing and circulating circle of circles, captured in the circle of the encyclopedia system, noting the etymology of encyclopedia itself from cyclical. To borrow the old description, God is an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. But what exactly is the significance of this relation between religion and philosophy in Hegel's philosophical system? The German Jewish poet and Hegel student Heinrich Heine related an apocryphal tale 
that Hegel's final words were the following. Only one man understood me, and even he did not understand me. These words certainly ring true in light of the many debates and disagreements about Hegel's philosophy that followed in the wake of his death, and that continue to this day. Immediately after Hegel's passing, his followers split into two camps, the old or right Hegelians and the young or left Hegelians. Regarding the relation between philosophy and religion, the old Hegelians took Hegel's position to be that philosophy ultimately vindicates the claims of traditional religion by showing religion's fundamental philosophical rationality. In contrast, the young Hegelians took Hegel's position to be that philosophy overcomes traditional religion by extracting its core rational philosophical truth, after which it could be discarded as so much illusion or superstition. For Karl Marx, Hegel's philosophy itself needed to be subjected to a similar operation. According to Marx, the rational kernel of the Hegelian dialectic must be extracted from its mystical shell in order to yield Marx's own dialectical materialism. Evidently, Marx regarded Hegel's system as outwardly mystical, a mysticism that is supposedly opposed to an inner rationalism. My argument in this video will be that Marx was half right, but for the wrong reasons. Hegel's philosophy is indeed mystical, but this mysticism reaches to the core and is identical with Hegel's rationalism. These early debates between the old and young Hegelians are echoed in contemporary Hegel scholarship, especially in the disagreements between the so-called traditional metaphysical, non-metaphysical, and revised metaphysical readings of Hegel. See Paul Redding's Stanford Encyclopedia Philosophy article on Hegel for a great survey of this debate. Without going into all the complex details here, suffice it to say that scholars continue to disagree over whether Hegel's religious, theological, and as we'll see, mystical language should be taken at face value, as per the traditional metaphysical reading, or whether it should be understood as a metaphorical way of expressing his ultimately naturalist, materialist, or even atheist position, the non-metaphysical and revised metaphysical readings. For scholars who set out to defend the traditional metaphysical view of Hegel's philosophy as one that affirms the truths of religion and mysticism, a crucial strategy is to turn to Hegel's own self-professed influences, among which there are countless religious and philosophical mystics. To begin with, there is Plato and the subsequent ancient tradition of Neoplatonism. Plato, to whom the whole of Western philosophy is but a series of footnotes, as Whitehead once said, is a true philosophical mystic, if ever there was one. For Plato, the goal of philosophy is to raise us up from the shadows of the sensible material world to the contemplation of the eternal intelligible world, the divine ideas or forms, and above all, the infinite transcendent light of the good. Hegel calls Plato, along with Aristotle, the greatest teachers of the human race, and their influence suffuses Hegel's system in its entirety. The later school of Neoplatonism developed Plato's mystical tendencies even further, devising specific mystical practices, contemplative meditation, theurgic ritual, ecstatic prayer, and so on, designed to assist the initiate in raising themselves up through higher and higher divine emanations until achieving ultimate union or henosis with the One. In his lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel calls Neoplatonism the height and indeed the zenith of ancient philosophy as a whole. The scholarship of the late Jens Hafassen has convincingly shown that Neoplatonic ideas permeate Hegel's system. For example, Hegel's triad of logic, nature, spirit is effectively a rearrangement of the three Neoplatonic divine hypotheses of the one, intellect, and soul. 
Notably, Hegel considers the standard view of an opposition between Plato and Aristotle to be false. He writes that Neoplatonism could just as well have been called Neo-Aristotelianism. Glenn McGee's 2001 monograph, Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition, traces the influence of numerous mystical, esoteric, and hermetic thinkers and schools on the development of Hegel's philosophy. One such important influence is Kabbalah, which Hegel speaks about explicitly in his lectures on the history of philosophy. Hegel clearly had significant knowledge of Kabbalah, which was not uncommon among his contemporaries, for example, Schelling, Goethe, and others, many of whom shared his mystical and esoteric interests. An important Kabbalistic idea with deep resonances in Hegel is that of Tzimtzum, or divine contraction. As Paul Franks has argued, Hegel's conception of God precisely mirrors the Kabbalistic notion of Tzimtzum. God, the absolute idea, cannot remain content with the eternal contemplation of God's own essence, logic. And so God negates God's self, contracts or withdraws in order to give rise to a world, nature. But this first negation of God is itself negated in and through human beings, or spirit. Finally, through philosophical contemplation, absolute spirit, human beings return to and unite with their divine source, the absolute idea, and complete the process of God's self-actualization within the world. McGee also adduces the influence of countless other mystical figures, including, but not limited to, Jakob Bohm, F.C. Oettinger, Meister Eckhart, and Nicholas of Cusa. Hegel goes so far as to call Bohm the humble German shoemaker turned radical mystic and visionary, the first modern philosopher. The 18th century theosophist Oettinger, a devotee of Boma and Christian Kabbalism, was widely read throughout his and Hegel's native Swabia, a region in southwestern Germany, exerting a profound influence on Hegel and his contemporaries. Hegel was fond of quoting one of Meister Eckhart's famous mystical epigrams, the eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. My eye and God's eye are one eye, one seeing, one knowing, one love. As the story goes, upon being introduced to Eckhart's sermons by Franz von Bader, Hegel exclaimed, There we have what we were looking for. From Nicholas of Cusa, the 15th century cardinal, philosopher, and theologian, Hegel took the fundamental ideas of the negation of negation and the coincidentia oppositorum, or coincidence of opposites, more about which soon, both cornerstones of Cusa's mystical theology. One of the most well-attested influences on Hegel, and indeed on the whole movement of German idealism of which he was a part, was the 17th century Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza. As Hegel says, quote, you are either a Spinozist or not a philosopher at all. Before Hegel, Leibniz and Jacobi had directly identified Spinoza's conception of God as the one infinite substance in which all finite things are contained and of which they are an expression, as a philosophical version of Kabbalistic mysticism a controversial reading of Spinoza, to be sure. Hegel follows in this tradition by tracing Spinoza's philosophical positions to his Jewishness. Though in Paul Frank's words, quote, Hegel maintained in effect, although not in so many words, that Spinoza was not Kabbalistic enough. Hegel was critical of Spinoza for what he took to be Spinoza's denial of individual human freedom and subjectivity. But Hegel, like Spinoza, still affirms that all things come from God and return to God, that our knowledge of God is part of God's eternal, infinite self-knowledge, just as our love of God is part of God's infinite self-love, and so on. Hegel wasn't critical of Spinoza's mysticism as such. Rather, it would appear that Hegel wanted to develop his own higher form of philosophical mysticism, that would understand the absolute freedom of the human subject as the ultimate self-actualization of God within the world.
1828, Karl Kraus would coin the term panentheism to characterize the positions of both Hegel and Schelling in order to distinguish them from Spinoza's supposed pantheism. Panentheism literally means all is in God, panentheos, as opposed to pantheism, which means all is God, pantheos. Whereas Spinoza directly identifies God with nature, Hegel holds that nature is contained within God, while God is also more than merely the world of nature. Though, in fact, Spinoza's conception of nature is not reducible to the material spatio-temporal world, but also includes immaterial thinking, God's infinite intellect, and so on, and so puts it closer to panentheism, but that is another story. It is standard today to regard Kabbalah as espousing a panentheistic conception of God. Indeed, in general, panentheism is often considered one of the defining hallmarks of mysticism across all of the world's religious traditions. Hegel, then, would be no exception. All indications are that his philosophy does indeed properly belong to the world of philosophical mysticism, not despite, but because of his thoroughgoing rationalism. Let's dive directly into some of Hegel's major works to see how mysticism may play a role there. We can begin with what is perhaps Hegel's most famous work, his 1807 Phenomenology of Spirit, which is intended as a preparation for, or latter, to his encyclopedia system. Fair warning, the Phenomenology is one of the most difficult philosophical works ever written. I remember when I first tried to read it, I literally had no idea what the words on the page were trying to say. But rest assured that once you crack the code, the book can become quite clear. In the introduction to the phenomenology, Hegel lays out the goal of the book as absolute knowledge of the absolute, or simply absolute knowing, as the last chapter of the book is called. Hegel explains why absolute knowledge of the absolute has been so hard to come by in the two millennia long history of philosophy. Philosophers have hitherto had a mistaken idea about the absolute, or God, as an object out there to be known, something different from the knowing human subject. But in fact, the whole point of the phenomenology is just to show that this subject-object dualism or dichotomy is false. The truth of the matter is, according to Hegel, that I, the knowing subject, am not distinct from the absolute, the object of knowledge. Rather, the knower and the known are one and the same. The self and the absolute are one. Arguably, this is the basic core of philosophical mysticism, shared by the great mystical traditions of the world. For example, as the Upanishads put it, tat tvam asi, thou art that. Much later in the phenomenology, Hegel will give an explicit definition of mysticism, which expresses the aim of the book as a whole. Quote, For the mystical is not concealment of a secret or ignorance, but consists in the self knowing itself to be one with the divine being, and that this, therefore, is revealed. Of course, it will take the entirety of the phenomenology's grand journey from the simplest forms of consciousness through self-consciousness, reason, spirit, and religion, before finally reaching the unity of subject and object self and absolute, in absolute knowing. As McGee puts it, Hegel's phenomenology can be conceived as an enormous mystical initiation rite, transforming, purifying, and transmuting consciousness into absolute knowledge, gradually unifying the individual with the absolute, a unity that also preserves a distinction between the self and the absolute, to be sure, the identity of identity and non-identity, to borrow Hegel's famous formula. By reading the phenomenology, we ourselves are taken along this initiatory path, 
by following each form of consciousness higher and higher on Hegel's ladder. Our own consciousness becomes purified, transmuted, and transformed, finally attaining the unity of our own self with the absolute through absolute knowing. As we mentioned before, the first part of Hegel's system proper is logic as treated in the science of logic and the encyclopedia logic. Hegel's logic offers an account of the fundamental categories of pure thinking, which is simultaneously an account of the fundamental structures of being, together constituting God's eternal essence before creation. As I see it, Hegel's logic is replete with concepts familiar from many mystical traditions, but I'll touch on just a few. Hegel famously begins the logic with being pure being. Not this or that being, but being itself in its absolute purity. Yet Hegel immediately comes to the startling conclusion. Pure being is indistinguishable from pure nothing. Pure being is totally empty and indeterminate, so that there is nothing there at all. But to make matters worse, Pure nothing is indistinguishable from pure being. Nothingness itself is. And so it reveals itself to be the same pure being with which we began. This would appear to be a contradiction. Being is clearly not nothing, and nothing is not being. And yet it is also true that being is nothing, and nothing is being. The resolution to this contradiction comes when we realize that the very movement from being to nothing and from nothing to being is becoming. Hegel is telling us that everything that exists is in a state of becoming. Everything exists through an interplay of being and nothing, light and dark, presence and absence. This is true even of God. God is not merely a static or eternally self-same being, but rather also contains nothingness or negativity within God's self, which keeps God in an endless process of becoming, including God's manifestations in nature and spirit. Another important concept in Hegel's logic is the so-called true infinite, wahrhafte Unendlichkeit. Hegel argues that the traditional way of conceiving the relation between the finite and the infinite is mistaken. On the traditional view, the finite is separate from or opposed to the infinite. The finite is here, while the infinite is out there, so to speak. For example, on the traditional view, we finite human beings live down here in the finite world of creation, while God, the infinite being, dwells out there beyond this world. The finite is always striving to reach the infinite in this picture, but it can never quite get there. Yet Hegel argues on purely logical grounds that this entire way of conceiving of a separation between the finite and the infinite is fundamentally mistaken, calling this mistaken notion the bad infinite, or schlechte Unendlichkeit, to contrast it with the true infinite. By definition, the infinite is unlimited. If the finite was separated from the infinite, then the infinite would be limited by what it is not, that is, the finite. But then this putative infinite would be merely finite, hence a bad infinite, not truly infinite, qua unlimited, at all. To be truly infinite, the finite cannot be separated from the infinite. Rather, the finite must be always already contained within the infinite. The true infinite is precisely this unity of the finite and the infinite. The infinite would not be truly infinite without this unity with the finite, which is its self-expression. Just as the finite can only exist as a self-expression of the infinite. If God is the infinite being, then it logically follows that our finite world and all finite human beings within it must be contained within God. But conversely, it is also true 
that the infinite must be contained within the finite. The spark of God, the infinite, present within every finite being. Indeed, for Hegel, the true infinite is precisely the circle that starts at the simple or immediate infinite, negates itself by becoming finite, and then negates this negation, attaining true infinity, which encompasses the whole circular movement from the infinite to the finite and back again. We can see Hegel's conception of the true infinite at work in his philosophical interpretation of Christian mysticism. To begin with, as Hegel writes, quote, God before the creation of the world is alone. God is not the true God if he does not manifest himself outwardly. For God is only God in the act of creating the world, end quote. In other words, God, the infinite being, must create a finite world in order to be truly infinite. This is fully accomplished when the finite world overcomes its own finitude by returning to God in the form of absolute spirit, that is, with art, religion, and philosophy. This is captured more specifically through the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation, classically expressed as follows, God became man so that man could become God. The infinite God becomes a finite human being, Jesus, who suffers and dies so that we finite human beings, all of humanity, could be raised up to the infinity of the divine. For Hegel, the death of Jesus represents the fact that God is not an alien being out there somewhere. This God has died. Rather, God has become the Holy Spirit, which descends on and dwells within the community. As the Holy Spirit, God is fully present here and now within the loving community of the faithful. After all, God is love. And so when two or more people are gathered together in love, God is there. Indeed, God is this infinite presence of infinite love. Of course, for Hegel, religion as such remains subordinate to philosophy, which is the highest form of absolute spirit. Hegel ends his whole encyclopedia system with an untranslated quotation from Aristotle's Metaphysics, describing the relation between God's eternal contemplation and human philosophical contemplation. God is eternally engaged in contemplation, or theoria, while we can only engage in it from time to time. But when we do, it is our highest happiness and pleasure, since through it we most closely imitate God. God eternally contemplates God's self, specifically God's three manifestations, as logic, nature, and spirit. Likewise, philosophy contemplates this same systematic triad of logic, nature, and spirit. That is, it contemplates God. In fact, for Hegel, through contemplation, we become one with God, the ultimate consummation of Hegel's philosophical mysticism. The absolute idea, or God, completes its self-actualization through human contemplative activity, our self-thinking thought becoming one with God's self-thinking thought. As the encyclopedia's final sentence states, quote, the eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally remains active, engenders, and enjoys itself as absolute spirit, end quote. In the end, the absolute idea's journey from logic through nature to spirit, and ultimately to absolute spirit, is for the sake of this divine, absolute, and infinite enjoyment. So far, we've considered various mystical influences on Haeckel's development, and the presence of various mystical concepts and themes in Hegel's philosophy. But is Hegel really a true mystic? Critics from within the mystical tradition will argue that Hegel over-intellectualizes or rationalizes mysticism such that it is no longer truly mystical. Hegel himself seems to admit as much in the final edition to the encyclopedia's introduction. There he writes, that the mystical is normally 
taken to be synonymous with the mysterious and the incomprehensible. But in fact, as Hegel goes on to explain, the mystical is only incomprehensible for the understanding, or Verstand, Hegel's technical term for ordinary, one-sided, abstract, or finite thought. For Hegel, the understanding is limited to binary or oppositional thinking. It always thinks in terms of the binary oppositions between, for example, being and nothing, the finite and the infinite, subject and object, and so on. In contrast, mystical truths convey the unity of opposites, the unity of being and nothing, the unity of the finite and the infinite, the unity of subject and object, and so on. Since the understanding can only think in terms of abstract binary opposites, it must regard these mystical claims to a higher unity as mysterious or incomprehensible. However, Hegel maintains that there is something higher than the understanding, namely reason, or Vernunft, specifically so-called speculative reason, Hegel's name for the infinite and concrete thinking contained in his own philosophy. For Hegel, reason is capable of grasping the unity of opposites in rational and conceptual form, as Hegel's own philosophy is meant to show. The unity of being and nothing in becoming, the unity of the finite and the infinite in the true infinite, the unity of subject and object in the absolute. So what had appeared to be mysterious and incomprehensible for the understanding is in fact fully transparent and comprehensible for reason. Hegel's philosophical system as a whole precisely consists in the conceptual, rational comprehension of all unities of opposites, so that we can say, quote, the mystical is synonymous with the speculative. Thus, everything rational is to be called at the same time mystical, by which, however, nothing more or less is said than that it goes beyond the understanding, and in no way that it is to be regarded generally as inaccessible to thinking and as incomprehensible, end quote. Hegel would seem to be giving us only a qualified endorsement of mysticism. For Hegel, mystical truths are indeed true, but they remain inadequately grasped so long as we remain at the level of the mysteriousness and incomprehensibility of mystical experience, the usual hallmark of mysticism as such. Rather, Hegel himself thinks we need to use reason to grasp the deeper rational meaning of these mystical truths. This transparent rational form alone is fully adequate to the truths in question, overcoming all residue of mystery and ineffability or so Hegel claims. Is this a betrayal of mysticism? Hegel is claiming that his philosophy contains the same truths as mysticism, but renders them conceptually comprehensible through his own special method of speculative reason. One might think that this runs against the grain of virtually all mystical traditions, in which mystical truths precisely are forever mysterious and incomprehensible to rational thought, requiring instead a higher form of direct intuition or experience in order to access them. This latter view was espoused, for instance, by Hegel's contemporary and seminary roommate, Schelling, who held that the absolute was inaccessible to conceptual or rational thought. Rather, for Schelling, the absolute could only be accessed through a direct intuition or experience, which was necessarily ineffable. Schelling's absolute, as the indifference point between subject and object, being and nothing, finite and infinite, and so on, is the point at which all these distinctions fall away. And so it cannot be conceptually articulated, since all conceptual activity requires these oppositions. <clears throat> 
Hegel famously criticized Schelling's view of the absolute in the preface to the phenomenology, where, borrowing an old Yiddish proverb, Hegel calls the Schellingian absolute, quote, the night in which all cows are black. That is, the empty void in which nothing at all can be distinguished. For Hegel, if nothing can be said about this absolute, then it just is nothing at all. What could it be if nothing at all can be said about it? But Schelling would reply that this ineffability is precisely the point of the direct experience of the absolute. It would be a feature, not a bug, of his view, that nothing could be said about the absolute, since the absolute is precisely that which is beyond or higher than all saying, all thinking, and all reasoning. Perhaps in the end, despite Hegel's self-understanding of his own system as the highest achievement of the human spirit, Hegel's philosophy would only give us the intellectual or rational starting point of the mystical journey, preparing us for it by giving us a conceptual articulation of some of its findings. An articulation, however, that cannot replace the real thing. After all, it is one thing to conceptualize the unity of being and nothing, the finite and the infinite, or subject and object. It is quite another thing to experience this unity, to directly experience one's soul flowing into the universal becoming of all things, or to directly experience one's finitude returning into the true infinity of the absolute. Perhaps, as in Platonism, we must use the work of the intellect to ascend up from the temporal, sensible world into the eternal, intelligible world. But from there, there may still be a further step to be taken beyond the intellect, beyond reason. Against his own self-understanding and better judgment, Hegel would light the way on the beginning of this journey. But to reach the end, we would have to leave him behind or carry him with us forward. Whatever we may finally think about Hegel's relation to mysticism, whether he is ultimately faithful to the mystical tradition, whether he betrays it by translating it into rational conceptual terms or something in between, it is undeniable that he shares with mysticism a fundamental ethical commitment, notably to the virtues of love and forgiveness. As we saw, Hegel sees his own system as the philosophical truth of Christianity, whose central teachings are that God is love, and that God has reconciled us with God's self through the forgiveness of our sins. In a sense, absolute spirit is the absolute power of love and forgiveness. The very word absolute comes from the same root as absolution. Hegel's grand systematic ambition to philosophically comprehend all things is really an ambition to forgive all things. For as the old saying goes, tout comprendre c'est tout pardonner. To understand all is to forgive all. But Hegel does not simply have a naive or innocent trust in the goodness of the world. He recognizes the inescapability of pain, suffering, death, and so on. As he writes in the Phenomenology's preface, quote, Thus the life of God and divine cognition may well be spoken of as a disporting of love with itself. But this idea sinks into mere edification and even insipidity if it lacks the seriousness, the suffering, the patience, and the labor of the negative. End quote. 
Yet it is precisely from out of this negativity that a higher positivity can be achieved. Only by passing through the suffering of loss can we find true love. Only by passing through the pain of transgression can we find forgiveness. Only by passing through death can we find the true life of the spirit. In Hegel's powerful words, quote, death is of all things the most dreadful. And to hold fast to what is dead requires the greatest strength. Lacking strength, beauty hates the understanding for asking of her what it cannot do. But the life of spirit is not the life that shrinks from death and keeps itself untouched by devastation, but rather the life that endures it and maintains itself in it. It wins its truth only when, in utter dismemberment, it finds itself. It is this power, not as something positive, which closes its eyes to the negative, as when we say of something that it is nothing or is false, and then having done away with it, turn away and pass on to something else. On the contrary, spirit is this power only by looking the negative in the face and tarrying with it. This tarrying with the negative is the magical power that converts it into being. Only by tarrying with the no of negativity can we convert it into the yes of the spirit. Only by tarrying with death, by staring it in the face, can we invoke the magical power, perhaps the mystical power, to convert it into life. Thanks for joining me on this short journey through Hegel. I hope you enjoyed some absolute spirit today. I know I sure did. And as always, keep seeking.